Good evening. My name is Michael Hemesath, and I'm the president of St. John's University, and I'm honored to be here with you this evening for the 11th annual Eugene McCarthy Lecture. Before I tell you about our guests, it's incumbent upon me as president of St. John's to do something very important. If you look behind you, the honeycomb architecture of the Abbey Church, Abbey and University Church, appears to have purple lights. And it's just, it's very important for me just to be clear that those purple lights, much as we love our rivals down on Summit Avenue, those purple lights have nothing to do with the University of St. Thomas. Okay? What? What those purple lights symbolize is something that we're going to be accomplishing this evening. It is red and blue coming together and able to have a civil discourse about issues of politics and policy, something that's very important in this country, and we have not managed to have those kinds of conversations as well as we should have in the last years. St. John's is a place where those conversations take place, and we're delighted to have one of those conversations taking place this evening. I want to extend a warm St. John's welcome to our featured speaker, former Florida governor and 2016 Republican presidential candidate, Jeb Bush. and his interviewer, award-winning Minnesota public radio journalist and St. John's graduate, Gary Eichten. <laughs> We're very grateful to be hosting this event in this beautiful and sacred space, the St. John's Abbey and University Church. We're also honored to have with us this evening Senator McCarthy's son, Michael McCarthy, and his niece, Mary Beth McCartney Yarrow, who's joining us this evening from uh, Florida and from, Michigan, or from uh, Washington. And also this evening with us, our former Minnesota Senator and St. John's graduate, Dave Durenberger. the College of St. Benedict President, Mary Dana Hinton. And former member of the U.S. House of Representatives and current University of North Dakota President and St. John's alum, Mark Kennedy and his wife, Debbie. And finally, a heartfelt thanks to St. John's Board of Trustees member, Steve Halverson, for his instrumental role in bringing his friend, Governor Bush, to our campus. And also, in absentia, a special thanks to Dan and Catherine Whalen for the endowment that created the Eugene J. McCarthy Center at St. John's. Conscious and courage in public life were hallmarks of Eugene McCarthy, and St. John's was always in his blood. He graduated from St. John's at the age of 19 with top academic honors, while also excelling in baseball and hockey. Gene inspired countless students here on our campus, and he was even a member of the monastic community for a brief period of time. And although Gene's life took him far from Minnesota, and led him to a professional life in Washington, D.C., in Congress, and a run for the presidency, he never left this place. And tonight, we celebrate those McCarthy values of conscience and courage in everyday life. 
Thank you once again to Governor Bush and to our guest interviewer, Gary Eichen, as they strive to contribute to civil public discourse and the common good. And now I'd like to introduce my colleague, Matt Lindstrom, the Edward L. Henry Professor of Political Science and the director of the McCarthy Center. Thank you. Thank you, President Hemisath, and welcome to tonight's exciting program. What a great crowd. Beautiful lighting, Adam, as well. It's a big honor to lead the McCarthy Center into our second decade of existence. Last year, we celebrated the Center's 10th year and Gene McCarthy's 100th birthday, highlighted, in fact, by a congressional law to name the Collegeville Post Office over here after Senator McCarthy. For students out here, the McCarthy Center provides numerous opportunities for you to learn through our events on and off campus, through our study tours, including, in fact, one to New York City this May, as well as our mentor program. And if you're really lucky, you could get paired up with Gary Eichten here, Minnesota Public Radio. As our country and world evolve from the 2016 presidential election, Issues related to civility, inclusiveness, ethics, and equity continue to challenge us all here at St. Ben's and St. John's, as well as across the country. This lecture series has a theme of conscious and courage in public life. We all have the power to act, to be civil, civically engaged, and to burst out of our bubbles in order to build empathy as well as understanding. Like Senator Eugene McCarthy's lifelong efforts to challenge the status quo, Governor Jeb Bush's public service in Florida, as well as around the country, pushed the bar of excellence to new levels. Jeb Bush is never afraid to ask the question, why not? And then push for new ways of doing things from education to health care reform to a comprehensive plan to protect the Everglades, Governor Bush has developed bipartisan support for innovative solutions to vexing policy problems. And in the Benedictine spirit, he listens first and leads with grace and humility. So Governor Bush, we're thrilled you are here and welcome to St. John's St. Ben's. Thank you. I also would like to extend my deep appreciation to our good friend Gary Eichten for his participation in tonight's events. A trailblazer himself, I know all of us appreciate Gary's exemplary service to Minnesota Public Radio and our community at St. Ben's and St. John's. Students out there, uh, keep in mind, we have an Eichten Fellowship Program available to all students at St. Ben's and St. John's which gives you an opportunity to work at Minnesota Public Radio, so watch out for the, those emails inviting you to apply. And students, as I mentioned, if you're interested in the mentor program, you might have the opportunity to pair up with this guy here. As was Catherine Hockman, who is our student who will introduce our distinguished guests. Catherine was, in fact, paired up with Mr. Eichten. She is a uh, senior political science major and communication minor. She's been involved with the McCarthy Center since day one. She plays a critical role in our social media and just about everything else with the center. She's a stellar student. She studied abroad in South Africa. She's involved in the women's choir. She's involved in the crew. Just about everything else as well. I'm not sure how she does it, but she does a really good job and I appreciate your involvement with the McCarthy Center, Catherine. And I'd like to help me welcome Catherine to the stage. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Professor Lindstrom. It is an honor to introduce two exemplary individuals, both with unique careers in public service. The first, Gary Eichten, has served as my McCarthy Center mentor, which has been a wonderful experience. A graduate of St. John's University, Gary is a well-known figure in Minnesota. His voice became a staple in Minnesotan households 
for over 30 years, offering wit and insight every morning as the host of NPR's midday program. His distinguished career in the world of journalism started when Eichton was an undergrad at St. John's University. He served as a student announcer for KSJR, a radio station started in Collegeville in 1967. This unassuming station grew into Minnesota Public Radio and served as a forerunner for National Public Radio. His career in journalism is filled with accolades, from being awarded the 2011 Graven Award, recognizing his significant contributions to the field, along with helping develop two Peabody Award-winning documentaries. Eichton's non-confrontational, unbiased approach to reporting makes him a standout figure in this era of journalism. Please join me in welcoming Gary Eichton to our stage tonight. Thank you. It gives me great pleasure to introduce our 11th annual Eugene J. McCarthy Center lecturer, Governor Jeb Bush. Governor Bush graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. After graduation, he started a real estate development company, <laughs> which grew into one of the largest commercial real estate companies in South Florida. From 1987 to 1988, Governor Bush served as Florida's Secretary of Commerce. In 1989, Bush served as the campaign manager of Elena Ross Latinen, the first Cuban-American to be elected to Congress. Governor Bush was elected the 43rd governor of Florida on November 3, 1998, and remains one of the only Republican governors re-elected for a second term in the state's history. Throughout his terms as governor, Bush pushed for education reform in Florida's school system. This passion inspired Governor Bush to develop several nonprofits focusing on education, including the Foundation for Florida's Future and the Foundations for Excellence in Education. As you also may know, in 2016, Governor Bush ran for the Republican nomination of president. Governor Bush's dedication to serving the public and assisting working class Americans exemplifies the values held by Eugene J. McCarthy. Governor Bush's career and public service serves as an inspiration, not only for future policymakers, but for the students here at the College of St. Benedict's and St. John's University. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Governor Jeb Bush. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. You've done good. You've done good. Good evening. I'm Gary Eichten. My great honor to introduce Governor Jeb Bush, uh, former governor of Florida and former Republican candidate for president, Governor Bush has been... They may been... not have remembered that. That didn't last very long. <laughs> it was memorable, though, Governor. <laughs> yeah, that's my wife says. <laughs> Governor's been busy traveling the country talking about the big issues uh, facing America, education, immigration, race relations, the economy, health care, President Trump. So uh, let's get started. Lots of ground to cover. Governor, uh, thanks for being here. Uh, you big. Bet, Big turnout for you. Good to be here. Uh, I had a, spent the day this afternoon uh, touring the campus. I don't know what's better, the football team and the stadium or the uh, incredible Bible that's going to be shown to the, the, the world in the next couple of weeks or the, the kiln uh, with world-class pottery. I don't know. I've, I've, and the, or the students. I don't know. Maybe the president. <laughs> It's like tied for fifth, five, five <laughs> incredible things I've, I've enjoyed by being here, and it's a joy to be with you all as well. Well, I do want to focus on uh, leadership and uh, public service and the rest, but a couple of quick questions before we get started. What's the uh, situation in Florida right now, your hometown, Miami? Miami's doing all right. Um, we had, I think we had seven million homes without power um, when the storm went through. Steve lives in Jacksonville, and I don't think people up there expected uh, the storm surge to flood, you know, downtown Jacksonville with eight feet of water. Um, it, it hit the whole peninsula, so it was devastating in that regard. But we we were blessed. We didn't get hit by uh, in Miami. We didn't get hit by the. Um, we had flurries of hurricane force winds. Um, Florida has is pretty good at this, though, Gary. We we have we've had our fair share. I had eight hurricanes and four tropical storms in 16 months. And the citizens of the state and the local and state officials really got good at preparing and recovering quickly, and that's what they're doing now. So 
Governor Scott's done a good job. Uh, FEMA's done a good job. FEMA wasn't as good. Um, they, what FEMA, the President Obama did some good things and some bad things. I would say as president, the best thing he did was hire Craig Fugate, who was my uh, uh, emergency operations center guy. For eight years, he served as FEMA, and he reformed it dramatically. And they've been responsive. So I'm, I'm confident that Florida will get back on its feet. Less confident about Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, and the Caribbean Islands. I worry about my, my wife's from Mexico. I worry about the earthquake there. There's, we've had a run of natural disasters that are pretty devastating. Uh, Harvey did the same thing in Texas. So if you're in the praying mood, uh, pray for the people that are suffering from these disasters and hope that they recover quickly. There's a theory, as you well know, Governor, that the uh, rash of serious, severe weather events is the result of climate change. Do you buy that? No, I don't buy it. I mean, we had 10 years. We had eight hurricanes and four tropical storms 10 years ago. Uh, and then we didn't have a storm till, um, that brushed our state last year, and then Irma hit it. Uh, what I would say is that the severity of these storms may be, may be worse, uh, given the uh, water temperatures in the, in the Gulf and in the Atlantic Ocean being hotter. That does bring more powerful storms, but the, the, the number of storms isn't, uh, there's, no, there's no actual direct proof that it's because of climate change. One of the problems is people like living in paradise. We have a thousand people a day moving into our state, and generally people like to live on the coast. So the impact of these storms has impacts a broader number of people for sure. Houston is the fastest growing city in the United States. They have a great business climate, uh, lots of high wage jobs, and so uh, this impact is now impacting broader, larger numbers of people as well. So. Um, what we, what we should do, though, rather than get in a debate about politicizing hurricanes, because that's the last thing people really want to hear about when they don't have power and don't have water and lost their jobs, what we ought to do is plan for the long-term things. Assume for a moment that uh, the climate is changing, which it is, then put in place local mitigation plans to, to deal with this over a long-term basis. So Houston, the Gulf Coast area of Texas, has something like you take Louisiana and Texas, it's two-thirds of the refining capacity of the United States. It's, a, it's an economic security issue, but they've, they keep rebuilding in flood zones and surprised that they're floods. Maybe they need to invest in long-term mitigation to deal with, uh, with dealing with that. Similarly in Florida, the, the tides are rising moderately, but that has an impact on our, on our state for sure. We need to begin to change our land use planning and um, how we deal with growth management. In a fast-growing state, we can't just keep doing the same thing given the, the changing nature of the climate. Let's move on to uh, President Donald Trump. Uh, you predicted... Why? What, what, what's the point? I mean, he's, <laughs> he's, 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 he's so... No, I wasn't making that point. I was going to be he's so uninteresting. He's never, never in the news. He never says anything. Why would you want to talk about him? You predicted that uh, he was going to be a We're chaos anyway. president. Uh, is he? He's chaotic, for damn sure, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, it's either a strategy or it's his character. Uh, one way or the other, it's, it's uh, increasingly about him, or consistently about him, and uh, it makes it harder to achieve the things that I'm sure he and his team want to achieve. You can't, leadership's not about creating chaos around you so that everybody's speculating about what you say and why you say it. It's about developing strategies and bringing people towards those strategies to accomplish things. And in the case of Washington, our democracy requires uh, bipartisanship and it also requires leadership to bring order to a rambunctious Republican Party as well. And the president, um, when it's all about him and the chaos he brings with him, is not helping his cause. Should we be encouraged by his willingness to talk with the Democrats about, you know, some substantial issues, government shutdown, hurricane relief, yeah, no, that I think, kind of thing? Is that good? Or I guess I'm old school. I don't think that's a bad thing at all. Mm -hmm. um, I, <laughs> all of a sudden, they're uh, Chuck, and, Chuck and Nancy. All of a sudden, it's like a... <laughs> They, you know, it's kind of funny how uh, they were demonized the day before and now they're, they're best buddies. But look, anything we can do to get to substantial, I mean, the problem in Washington is even when people agree they can't 
get to, you know, get to yes and get to a conclusion. And that, the, the founders envisioned a, they created a system designed around divided government and the friction between the executive and the legislative and the judiciary. And in between the legislature, you know, the, in the Congress, there's, there's a natural friction that was designed by our founders and it requires a commitment to compromise, to build consensus and to forge forge uh, agreements to get to yes. And right now, that muscle is atrophied beyond belief. It is, it is gone. Can I give you an example of it? Because sure. it, it doesn't, it's a nerdy subject, but an important one. About four years ago, um, the scandal of the Veterans Administration first came out, and scandalous beyond belief, of people that died on waiting lists, and people were bonused because they got rid of the waiting list by not giving care. They just got, they just got rid of the waiting list and $130 million of bonuses went out to these career civil service uh, people that have lifetime protection and employment. So the Congress got, you know, legitimately angry. The House passed a bill. The Senate passed a bill. John McCain was the, was the committee chair. Bernie Sanders was the uh, ranking member. In the House, it was Jeff Miller and a Democrat. And they go to conference. It's kind of, this is like, you know, how a bill is made. It's like third grade Sesame Street mm -hmm. things, you know. This is, so they go to conference, and McCain tells me this story that the other three members start arguing, undoing where they had already had agreed, which, Senator, tell me if I'm wrong, but you're supposed to put those aside. If you've already agreed, you're supposed to put those aside and focus on the four or five things that you don't agree on and reach compromise and consensus and go forward. So McCain, who's kind of a cantankerous soul, um, got angry and started shouting profanities, I think, and said, I'm going on the floor of the Senate and I'm going to call all you guys out because you don't know what you're doing. And then it dawned on him, he told me the story, that they'd never been to conference committee before. Didn't know how it worked. They didn't know how it worked. So you have members of the legislature that have been elected since 2008 or 2006 when the gridlock started in, a, in the dramatic faction fashion that it is, that have never actually seen how our democracy is supposed to work. They're arm camps, they're tri two tribes, maybe six tribes in the Republican Party, two or three in the Democratic Party, they're all in their little, little, you know, niches, and they don't know how it works. So we've got a long way to go to get to where we need to be. And you would want a president to understand that and to try to begin to, to, to move back to how regular order business is supposed to be taking place. We're the greatest country in the face of the earth. And our democracy, it's not, it, it, look, think about it. We, we've had a pretty good ride. 200 and what, 40 years mm -hmm. of existence. This, this massive gridlock, you could count maybe two decades worth of massive gridlock in our country's history. You count the Civil War, you count what's going on now, uh, and a few other times in our history. But most of the time, we've had leaders that have been able to forge consensus. And I think it's incumbent upon us as citizens of this country to demand it again. It happens in the state capitals. It should happen in Washington. Let me ask you this, kind of a moral, ethical question. So you're a member of Congress today, and you're really unhappy with President Trump. Really unhappy. You find him, the things he says and does, does just morally uh, yeah. just bad. Okay. Uh, he comes out with a program that is public policy-wise pretty good. Yeah. Do you support him yes. or do you stand and say, "By golly, we I can't I yeah. can't get stand with you." My my advice is get some therapy on the Trump derangement syndrome part of this. You know where you're like freaking out because it's Donald Trump and because that plays in that's that's where he gets his energy. Everybody you know yelling and screaming about the outrageous things that he does or says, because he, he does far little less than what he says uh, in terms of the outrageousness. He says outrageous things, but his actual, you know, it, it, it's emerging that the policies are a little more orthodox than, he's not draining the swamp for sure, and the tax reform issues, the foreign policy issues are more mainstream than, than, than notwithstanding what he says, they're, they're emerging as more mainstream. So, Yes, if you, if you don't like him, put that aside, get your therapy there, take care of whatever it is, you know, it's like, it's, it's nuts, but I, mean, I have to give therapy on airplanes now. And I'm not a big Trump fan, as you can tell, but, you know, take a, take a chill pill, and when you have an agreement with him, 
or, or anybody else in Washington, it's not just President Trump, if you have an agreement, shake a hand and do the deal for crying out loud. I mean, what's wrong with that? That's, that's the way it's supposed to work. And it's, you're not violating your principles when you find a way to find common ground with someone who may not agree with you on 90% of the things, but on that one thing they do. So DACA would be a good example. The, the so-called dreamers, have many of them have been in the country since they were four or five, some 15 years old. There's 800,000 of them. They came here illegally, but they came through no fault of their own. They came with their parents. They have no nexus to their former country. Many of them don't even speak the language. Uh, they've made their mark in our country. 70% of Americans believe that they should be given legal status. Most believe they should be given citizenship. A majority of Republicans believe that that's the case. For crying out, the president believes that that's the case now. He's, he's had a nice uh, change towards, um, towards the right direction. Uh, Chuck and Nancy believe it, and <laughs> Speaker Ryan and, and McConnell believe it. For so oh, here's an example. Everybody agrees, and that should be done in a week, literally. It's, mm -hmm. it's not the most complicated thing in the world, but because everybody's on guard, everybody's worried about getting primaried, everybody's worried about their own interests, we've, we've lost this ability to, to forge uh, the kind of consensus that on the easy things to get done. I mean, there are a lot of tough things where there's big disagreements, we got to get the easy things done first so that the atrophy in that, in that consensus muscle begins to be built up again. Now, you uh, have said you're not interested in running for president again, right? I had a blast doing it, but um, <laughs> it, was, it, was a, it was an incredible experience, I promise you. It was, um, it was an experience of a lifetime, but uh, I, I kind of feel, I don't feel functional obsolescence, but uh, the, the, what I believe that needs to be done and how you go about doing it, I feel a little out of place uh, running for president. We have to do things, it appears. I don't know. Uh, put well, let me put, ask put you. me aside for a moment because it's not about me. But uh, look, I'm 64. I gave it my best shot. There are, there's a whole new generation of, of conservative leaders that I think will emerge going forward. Let me, let me ask you this question. Let's assume that you did get elected. How, setting aside the stylistic stuff and the, the bombast and all that, setting that aside, how would a President Bush differ from President Trump? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Come on. I mean, really, uh, I, I would hope that I would uh, be no, more in, humble. In terms of policies and stuff like no, that? No, there, there's a question of leadership first and foremost. Uh -huh. Look, ideology matters. I'm, I'm a, you know, I got to execute on timeless principles that I truly believe in, which are about entrepreneurial capitalism, limited government. I'm a, I'm a conservative. On moral issues, I was a conservative, and, I, and I, it was a joy to be able to act on my core beliefs. And whenever I had a chance to do it, I did it, and I did it with gusto. I did it with as much energy as possible. Um, but this is not just about ideology, it's about leadership as well. And leaders have to be humble in, comp in complex times. It's not all about them. So the first step that a, in a, in a very hyper-partisan environment, uh, President Obama could have been, I think, in, in many ways, could have been a trans transcendent president had he recognized that he could have changed the climate. But he, he got frustrated, he doubled down on his team, he jammed down Obamacare, Dodd-Frank, down the throat, he used executive powers without going to Congress, some of which he didn't have the authority to do, some of which he did. He, he, he made the situation that was getting worse, even worse, and President Trump has not tried to, to change that to any significant degree. So the first step is to listen to what the other side has to say, have the humility to say, look, I got my deeply held views, but that doesn't mean I disrespect you for having deeply held views that disagree with me. Uh, build consensus from outside, from, you know, outside in, from, from down up, rather than trying to do it the way that has been going on now, which is the exact opposite. It's, it's you know, up, down, and I'm, you know, powers in Washington out. We need to get back to what America does really well. We're a bottom-up country. Mm -hmm. And so listening and having the skills to make this happen. There have been extraordinary presidents in our history. If 
you think about it, that we're flawed and we're all imperfect under God's watchful eye, right? I mean, that's the nature, that's the one thing we all have in common is that we are imperfect. Think of Lyndon Johnson. Have you read Caro's book, Caro's book on Johnson, the last volume? Parts of it, yes. Uh -huh. Phenomenal book. Uh, for the six weeks or seven weeks after the assassination of John F. Kennedy, Vice President, then President uh, Johnson, got the Kennedy tax cuts passed. I always call them the Kennedy tax cuts because as a conservative, we always threw that into the face of the liberal saying, well, your guy, you know, for, was for the 25% across the board cut in taxes. That was Lyndon Johnson that got that passed. Mm -hmm. He created a budget that was for the first time since World War II had a dollar for dollar reduction, not because he wanted it, but because he was setting the stage for the most meaningful civil rights legislation passed in this country's history. He did all this with all in leadership. He was humble where it was appropriate. He was threatening when it was appropriate. He, he didn't let people up for air when it was appropriate, but he made it his mission to get these things done in a very divided country at a time when um, you know, we had just gone through the tragedy of the assassination of a president. Restoring that may be more difficult in this environment, but it, I think it's incumbent upon governors, mayors, and presidents particularly to try to create that climate where that can come back again. You, uh, of course, ran in, in the 2016 campaign. We're told that the Russians were actively trying to influence that campaign. Did you get any sense of that? Do you think there was collusion between the Trump people and the Russians? I don't know. If they did it, they were pretty inept about it. Um, look, I mean, the, the net result of the election was that Hillary Clinton stopped going to the places where she needed to go to win. I mean, the, the, the simple fact is that, that she lost Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, three states that Republicans hadn't won in a long, long while. And uh, she ran a, a campaign that, that uh, disaffected a lot of working class Democrats that historically had voted for the Democratic nominee. Um, that's the reality. I know that will upset Clinton supporters, but she ran a horrible campaign. I don't think the collusion, if there was any, and we'll find out soon, I'm sure, uh, that pales by comparison to the, to the ineptitude of the Clinton campaign. North Korea, um, what is a practical matter, uh, can the U.S. or anybody else do to uh, stop the North Korean nuclear program? Well, I think there's a lot of things that we can do. This is a place where President Trump seems to be moving in the right direction. Again, rhetorically, I'm not sure calling the guy Rocket Man is going to like change the course of history. Um, it's just, it's, it's a distraction from the seriousness of this. That's like, you know, people always have made fun of the presidents of North Korea, both his father uh, particularly and he, uh, the dictators, and we, we, we make light of, of, of them, but they are brutal dictators. People are starving to death. Uh, they'll kill, you know, relatives. Um, I'm sure we all have that secret desire, but in North Korea they actually act on it. Uh, and they have built nuclear capability that is now reaching the point where they, you could imagine in rel relatively short order that they would have the capability of, of uh, having the ballistic missile capability to launch a nuclear attack on U.S. territory. So this is, and certainly Japan and Korea. So this is serious business. And so belittling the guy is not really the answer, but putting um, tougher sanctions in place, putting pressure on China, uh, all of these things are important. Russia can play a constructive role. The question is whether or not we should get out of the agreement. And, you know, my, uh, as a candidate, I felt like that we should get out of the agreement, that it was poorly negotiated. All the benefits accrued to, um, uh, you know, not, I'm talking about Iran, but the, the agreement as it relates to Iran and, and Korea, how we, how we deal with them, uh, I'm beginning to believe that we need to put increasing pressure um, across the board and be willing then to talk uh, once there is, you know, a changing kind of uh, a direction. Because right now it looks like the North Koreans feel like they, they have the, the upper hand. Um, there, are, there are sanctions that could be put in place with Chinese uh, companies that are doing business in, in um, North Korea. Certainly, uh, increased sanctions as it relates to um, the import of oil, which 
has been, has been done by UN resolution now, continuing that progress has to be part of this. And the cooperation between Iran and uh, North Korea should give us great concern as well. So look, the president has, the good news is President Trump uh, may say things that are kind of seem out of the ordinary in the midst of a, a, what is a, a looming crisis, but he's got really good people around him dealing with this issue. Uh, Secretary Mattis and McMaster, I think Tillerson, all of these guys. Uh, Nikki Haley's done a good job as UN ambassador. He has a talented t foreign policy team that gives me some comfort. He did go to the UN this week, though, and say that he's prepared to totally destroy North Korea if they don't toe yeah. the line. Do you, uh, Governor, just personally, I mean, do you ever go to bed thinking, good Lord, we could end up in a nuclear war? I hope not. Uh, you know, the, the whole 50 years or 60 years of existence was we had a deterrent effect that that avoided that conversation. And talking loosely about this stuff does give me pause, does give me concern. Trump, when the, in the campaign, in the debate, one of these debates, someone, it was uh, Hugh Hewitt, asked him about the nuclear triad, who he's, he's quite, uh, he's pretty obsessive about the nuclear triad, Hugh Hewitt is, for good reason. It's an important part of this deterrent, and it's aging. And so he wanted to ask Trump this question, and Trump clearly had no clue what triad was. And it was kind of scary. And then his, then his um, Hope Hicks came on the, uh, the next day and when asked about, well, what did President Trump mean by, the, by not having a real answer to this? And he said, look, what you need to know is that he's prepared to use it. Wrong answer. I mean, the deterrent effect is not to use it. It's not, not to be constantly threatening to use it. It's to have the quiet strength and the diplomat, diplomacy to back it up to avoid these conversations. And getting back in the game as it relates to uh, di you know, aggressive diplomacy backed by economic sanctions and having the military wherewithal as the last resort has got to be the policy. Looks like the Senate will be voting on another uh, health care bill next week, another yep. uh, effort to repeal uh, Obamacare. Uh, should the Senate and the House pass that legislation, or should the members of Congress try to work out something else? Well, they need to work out something else because Obamacare is not working. Um, I like the idea of shifting power away from Washington wherever possible back to the states. Remember, I was a governor for eight years. We actually got a waiver uh, from on the Medicaid program in Florida, that a mother of all waivers, really, to, to recast our Medicaid program for uh, Fort Lauderdale and Jacksonville, which would have been the 25th largest Medicaid program. It was a defined contribution plan, similar to, to the, uh, the Cassidy-Graham bill. It, it created choice counseling for Medicaid beneficiaries, so they were making informed choices. They all had different choices. They weren't assigned to plans. Uh, if they made healthy lifestyle decisions, they were given $250 extra to be able to continue to make those healthy lifestyle decisions. They could take the premium uh, that was, that was uh, theirs for, from the Medicaid program and go to a private, go to their employer and pay for, the, pay, pay for their private plan. It was very innovative and it worked. And we reduced costs dramatically and we improved outcomes and the Medicaid beneficiaries based on the consumer surveys we did believed it was a better deal. So why not try different things? I mean, Florida would have approach that might be different than Minnesota, um, and California may go for a single payer system or a version of that, uh, which would be disastrous, but the federal system should be allowed to, to thrive, I think, in this environment. Why do we always assume that Washington's got it figured out? There's no evidence they do. Why do we always default to them? I mean. Can give me a, other than you know defending our shores, they do a pretty good job of that. I think the military does a good job. Do you th honestly think that um, training programs designed in Washington are better than the bottom-up training programs, or child uh, the child welfare system works better when it's imposed by people in Washington? I, I I think our country thrives when we embrace the federalist model. The founders envisioned it that way, and I think we should go back to that. But, you know, the CBO is, well, who knows what they're really going to say about this new bill, but most likely we'll find that tens of millions of people will lose their insurance or be underinsured. Oh, no. you know, look, and then, uh, I mean, is, all, isn't it better respect, what we have now? No. No, I don't think so. I, what, it was bad before, to be clear. Our insurance system was, was 
broken before Obamacare. Obamacare hasn't made it necessarily better. It's made it more costly. More people have insurance, but the people that are subsidizing the people that have gotten insurance, most of which are in Medicaid, by the way, that will be block granted down, they're not going to lose their, 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 uh, their insurance. The CBO is designed uh, for whatever, has a bias towards undercounting revenue and overcounting spending in terms of projecting out. So I'm not, I wouldn't fret as much about that. Uh, you, you have the, and they do it on a baseline that is not like a family budget. So the baseline for Medicaid is like this, kind of about an 8% run rate. Anything that you do to cut the 8% to 6% or 5%, that's a cut. Well, bring that on in my family budget. I would love that. Uh, if I could have, if, if cuts were cutting the, in, the growth in my spending by, you know, that kind of amount. But in Washington, that's the way they operate. So um, the question is, how much power do we want Washington, D.C. to have, and how much innovation do we need to make our healthcare delivery system work far better? And I would argue we need a lot less of Washington and a lot more innovation to take place. So I would be a supporter as long as you have the, the issue that needs to be clearly defined is the question of pre-existing conditions. If you opt out of requiring pre-existing conditions in your new insurance system, you better have a clear, a clear, easy to understand alternative that makes it clear to families that they're not going to, they're, they're going to have access to care for people that have chronic illness. And I think this country ought to have the ability, given our given our prosperity, they're not cutting any of the, the, the existing budget, by the way, which is why conservatives are somewhat upset about this. This is, you know, the taxes and spending stay in place. I think a country as prosperous as ours can, can make that guarantee that if someone is, has a uh, genetic illness, a chronic illness, that it's no fault of their own that they're going to be taken care of. A couple of education questions. You're been very active in, in education reform. What do you mean when you talk about education reform? What, what does that mean? Eliminate the public school system no, as we know no, it? No, uh, that's, man. Uh, critics always talk yeah, about I know. that. Yeah, I know. It's, that's, that's, the old, that's the new debate is that you demonize before you actually have a, a conversation. So um, a system that was designed in the, you know, look, we have, a, we have a, our school systems designed on an industrial model. We have 32,000, excuse me, 13,000 school boards that are government-run monopolies uh, with an agricultural model as it relates to the number of days that they spend because, you know, all the kids have to get out in the fields to harvest the crops, right? In Miami, that's what we do, uh, 180 days. And um, it's, it's not student-centered. Time is, is the constant. Learning's the variable. So if I, to simplify my passion for this is, let's turn that on its head. Learning should be the constant. God has given every child the ability to learn. They learn at different paces and different ways, but it's there. Every child can learn. We cannot ex continue to excuse away the fact that so many children don't. It's not life circumstances that, that, uh, that dictate someone's destiny. If you had a quality education for every child, irrespective of the level of their income, the color of their skin, where they have a valet in their name, all that stuff ought to be cast aside, and we need to move to a student-centered system where you learn at your own pace, but when you master the material, you move on. But if you can't master the material, we do something else to assure that you do. In Florida, we had a third of our kids in third grade that were functionally illiterate on our measurement. They were level one readers on our dreaded FCAT, the state test, that gives kids acne and all sorts of uh, contagious diseases, apparently. But we measured it, and a third of our kids were functionally illiterate, the way I would define it, and we eliminated social promotion in third grade. Because if you, if you can't read by fourth grade, the simple fact is those gaps grow and grow, and we know what the pathologies that develop. You're not gonna graduate from high school, in many, you're going to, there's a higher probability of incarceration. You're not going to have the skills necessary to live a purposeful life in the new economy that we're moving towards. So we eliminated social promotion. It was a pretty radical idea. And in its place, we said, we're going to put reading coaches in every school to teach teachers how to teach reading, because our schools of education don't. We're going to embrace universal pre-K, first state, I think, to have voluntary universal pre-K for, for a half-day program. 
we, we made reading our highest priority. We had summer schools for kids that were struggling, and we cut that in one year's time, we cut that in half. And Florida went from f literally the bottom of the pack in the nation's report card on fourth grade reading to six out of 50. And we have 56% of our kids are minority students, and 57% are free and reduced lunch qualified. So I just reject the notion that the, the establishment in education you know, constantly says, whispers sometimes, openly says it, it's not fair to impose accountability on top of our systems because some kids just can't do it. Well, in Florida, we've proven them wrong. All kids can learn. Why don't we just change the dynamic to be focused on them rather than the economic interest of the adults? I've kind of become a little radicalized about this because we, don't, we shouldn't have the, the complacency about this. Look, I mean, a third of our kids are truly college or career ready. And for those that are sitting in Minnesota saying, well, we're not in Minnesota, we're, you know, like, wow, we're, we're, we're great. Well, you're pretty good. But so it's 40%, okay? 40% of your kids are college and or career ready after we spend more per student than any country in the world. Now, how are we gonna, how are we gonna compete in a world where education has a higher priority in many countries than what we have here in the United States. So I think there should be much more confrontation about the status quo and defending it against, you know, ch challenging the status quo and trying to figure out a way to make this, uh, you know, a left-right coalition again where we depoliticize it and begin to um, dramatically challenge how we, how we move our education system into the 21st century. Question uh, about higher ed, uh, and then I want to mix in some audience questions. Um, how do you balance uh, the, uh, the need for free speech on campus versus what some people would describe as hate speech on campus? Well, so I, I spoke at, I have, I've had some experience with this. Um, I taught a course at Harvard for a while, and I had no problems at all. And I, you know, I thought I was behind enemy lines a little bit. It was a away game at, at Harvard, uh, but never, never felt any pressure at all. Um, I went to Cornell, not a problem. There's like a thousand people there, but the president of, the, of Cornell or the provost got up and, and read this lengthy thing that was faculty-driven that said, you know, we 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 allow differing points of view. We allow guests to come to speak on campus. And, uh, but we also allow people to dissent. And I'm, I kind of elbowed the president as they're going through this lengthy committee-driven uh, <laughs> speech document. I go, does that mean I'm gonna get, you know, they're gonna charge the podium here? He said, don't worry, we got, we got, uh, we got cops all around. So that's the last thing I heard before I went up to speak. Look, I mean, children, these, these aren't children that are going to un, you know, universities. These are, these are emerging, talented adults. They can, they can take it when someone comes to their campus and speaks a view that is different than theirs, whether it's from the left or from the right. I mean, I think we all need to put on our big boy pants and big girl pants and allow for freedom of expression, much more than what it appears. I mean, people are tortured over this. Um, that's what universities, that's why they exist, is to have the chance for people to, to learn new things and to have different points of view. That's why I like going on college campuses, but some of these campuses have totally lost their minds. Mm -hmm. look, look, I mean, the Berkeley thing, Ben Shapiro, you know, was called a Nazi. He's Jewish, for crying out loud. I mean, it's like, what's up with this? It's the first Jewish Nazi I've ever, ever heard of. And, and he, you know, he didn't, he didn't support Trump. He, 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 he's a conservative. That's not being a Nazi. He's not a white supremacist. Uh, they spent $700,000 to protect him when he spoke at Berkeley. And they created this environment with, that almost provoked the kind of controversy uh, by, by being so defensive about, about the case. He had spoken there apparently before without any problems at all. So I think we just need to take it back to the chill pill. Maybe a couple of deep breaths on this particular subject would be good and allow people to come that have different points of view. Some uh, questions that were submitted earlier by, uh, by students on campus. Let's start with this one. Uh, since you come from a noted family of, of politicians, your father, your brother, so, so on. Son. 
Do you, uh, did you think that you would have to go into politics just to uphold the family name, or did you, uh, uh, you know, feel like you had to strike out on your own, carve your own path? How did how yeah, did you deal a, with that? That's a great question. Um, my interest in politics started when the greatest man I'll ever know in my entire life, my dad, ran for president. I was in Caracas, Venezuela, and had never really focused on politics. I had a I was 25 years old. I had two kids. Uh, my wife and I were there, and he's, he said he was running for president. My first question was, president of what? You know, it was like I, <laughs> I was pretty busy, focused on my own life. And I, I just felt a, a calling to give back to him. Mm -hmm. It was payback time for me. I mean, this guy is like, I'm going to get emotional talking about it, but he is truly, uh, if you had to pick, and a mom too, but if you had to pick a father to be, the son of, George H.W. Bush would be it. I mean, he is just a person of incredible integrity, kind, gentle, treats everybody, you know, the way you would want, um, Christ-like in, in many ways. And he's, so, so what the heck, I just, I told, I told Columba, we're heading back, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to volunteer in the campaign. We didn't have a lot of money, and so my, my first foray into politics, which was to be a surrogate and to be his travel aide in the 1980 campaign, was not about politics. But then I kind of liked it. I don't know. I just kind of overcame my fears. It's a crazy deal. I mean, there's all sorts of weird things that go on in campaigns, that's for sure. But um, so I got involved when I moved to Miami and uh, had a chance to be Secretary of Commerce and saw the role of the governor. I never really wanted to do anything but that. Mm -hmm. um, governors are, it's an extraordinary job. You can, can really craft, you can lead. You can, it's a great place. There's lots of runway to, to establish priorities, bring people to the cause, develop strategies, execute on strategies, all the things that you would, you know, most people would enjoy doing that, likes, that like to be in leadership roles. So my, my um, interest in politics was really driven by that. Could your dad or Ronald Reagan, for that matter, get elected today? I, you know, uh, I've, I've actually had an opinion about that, and I might as well say it again because it'll make news and everybody, the Twitter feed will go crazy. No. And you know who else agrees with me is Michael Reagan, uh, my friend. Uh, he believes his dad would not be elected in the environment we're on now. One of the greatest presidents of the 20th century, if not the, in my mind. I mean, he was, he was extraordinary in every way. He would have a hard time winning. Uh, he wouldn't be conservative enough, or he wouldn't be this enough, he wouldn't be that enough. He was too, too kind to people that didn't agree, you know, whatever. There's all sorts of reasons why in this environment he, he wouldn't demonize you enough. I don't know what the, it's very different now. Um, how, can you, how, how can society get back to a point where people like that would at least be considered, whether you like that yeah. particular guy or not. So I'll give you some tactical things that I think are necessary, and we all could play this. This is uh, these are Jeb's rules that are rules that I hope you would adapt as, adopt as well. If you you're on one team or the other, normally you're you're right down the middle. I'm sure you're a purple guy politically, after all the interviews you've done in life. But most people are on one team or the other, and if you are critical of someone's behavior or attitude or actions on the other team and you're critical and you're openly critical and then someone on your team does the exact same thing and you're silent, shame on you. You should have the exact same attitude about being critical of the behavior irrespective of whether it's a Democrat or a Republican. That would be one step. The second step is back to the DACA uh, idea or any other idea where there's broad consensus. Act on it. Get back to the business of, of actually doing smaller, constructive, important things and begin to, to realize that there's joy in accomplishing things rather than demonizing the other side. So uh, finding, finding those opportunities. Uh, third, uh, another tactic is what I call the Nixon to China moments. There are all sorts of, in politics and policy world, there's all sorts of opportunities. We did a lot of big things, some of which were very controversial, and one of the ways we got through the controversy was finding people that didn't look like me, didn't agree with me on many other things, but agreed on that one thing, and I put them as a partner in the effort um, because it changes the context. So they're, they're tactical things. But the broader question uh, relates to culture. 
The culture is different today. Mm -hmm. And I'm not an expert on culture, but ultimately we have to all look ourselves in the mirror. We're 330 million of us have to, we, we create our culture. It's not some foreign thing that's imposed on us. It's how we interact with everybody else, I think. That would be the easiest way to describe culture. And there has been, a, 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 we're different today. And uh, yeah, we're more polarized perhaps. The internet has something to do with this. We, we customize how we acquire our news, makes us really righteous because we get it validated each and every day. Well, I'm, I'm right again. Every time I read something, that guy's brilliant. He's a, I, he totally agrees with me. And then it also makes you, all the research suggests, it makes you less tolerant of other people's views. So that's a cultural phenomena that um, is, you know, interlaced with, uh, with the massive change that relates to uh, the Internet that has changed political discourse in ways that is, you know, phenomenal. So it's going to require a lot of work, but ultimately, look, We've had big cultural changes in our country. Uh, I've, I, my email address, by the way, is jeb at jeb.org. And if you have any, this is, this is really the question, is how do we change our culture so that, so that politics begins to work? It, our culture is not going to change because politics begins to work. It's the other way. It's us. We allow this to happen. And we have to change who we are in order for our political system ultimately to get back to how it has worked magnificently over most of the course of our history. So the only, the best example I know of of, of a change in culture was the uh, Second Great Awakening in the, in the 19th century, in I think 1820s, where Presbyterian ministers on fire for the Lord became evangelical and kind of put people back, re, you know, gave people a, a more purpose in their lives about why family mattered and why debauchery was bad and it not just brought a moral order back to the country that had kind of lost its way as we had all this massive westward migration, but it also brought about the abolitionist movement, the prohibitionist movement, and the women's suffrage movement all emerged from this big cultural phenomena that was, in this case, religiously driven. So um, I don't know what the next big cultural change is. I do think that culture does not move linearly, that there are moments in time where there's big there's a spark and new things emerge. And I'm hopeful that that will be a positive thing rather than a negative thing for our country. Uh, another Do you think I'm crazy about that, by the way? Is that? No, it sounds, it makes good sense, actually. Okay, good. I think. And with that and maybe a buck and a quarter, you can get a Coke. <laughs> uh, no, maybe a little, uh, okay. I'm All right, here's an audience question. Are there any policy areas that Congress could make bipartisan progress on or are we going to be stuck forever in gridlock? I think on technology questions, there's bipartisanship, potential bipartisanship to, we have all these rules around the old economy and we got a new economy that is dramatically different. And we have emerging monopolies that, that not emerging, they're there, that have as much power as the great oligarchs of uh, the early 20th century. And so I think there's an emerging consensus of hopefully not to kill uh, the innovation that comes from these, this uh, massive sea change, uh, but to, to bring, it, bring regulation into the 21st century. And that would be a big deal. I mean, that would, that's, that's an important thing to do, given how important technology and innovation and the internet is in, in our lives. Um, infrastructure mm -hmm. would be, certainly be a, um, a place where there's bipartisan support. There's going to have to be a little give and a little take. Um, I think we should leverage the federal dollars to include private dollars because I know for a fact there's literally trillions of dollars globally that is prepared to be invested in long-term infrastructure projects. Why wouldn't we want to leverage government monies with, uh, with these private sources that are looking for stable sources of uh, return over the long, long haul? So. Um, it's going to require some negotiating to get there, but there's, I don't know anybody that thinks that the level of infrastructure in this country is adequate for uh, long-term sustained growth. You look at the flooding in Houston, and um, there are homes and communities in, in the Houston area that have been flooded like three or four times in the last decade because they keep rebuilding them in the flood zone. Well, maybe 
you could save some money by investing in infrastructure to um, protect those areas uh, that, that need to be protected in a dramatically different way. And along the way, you know, protect a really viable um, economic national security issue, which is our refining complex as well. Those, those long-term infrastructure projects exist all around the country. You could just envision a, a left-right coalition around repatriating profits to the tune of $2 trillion cash sitting overseas because we have this crazy worldwide taxation system that, that, uh, that creates incentives for businesses to keep their money overseas. If you could repatriate that money with a one-time tax, create a pool of money that could be leveraged with private capital, local and state ca capital, eliminate some of the mind-numbing regulatory permitting that makes it impossible to build infrastructure in this country, uh, and create 50 projects of national purpose, you would help the economy and you would modernize infrastructure in this country. That would be an example of a left-right kind of coalition, and who knows, it, it could happen. Um. Let's see, does the phrase all is fair in love and war also apply to politics? Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Should it? It's a, <laughs> well, look, it's a, it shouldn't be to the, the demonization has probably gone too far, but we've had, I mean, hell, we've had, we've had politicians get killed. You know, so uh, ask, ask Alexander Hamilton how he feels about the, all is fair in love and war. I mean, there are examples of, of club-wielding congressmen beating the crap out of someone that he didn't agree with on the, on, the, on the floor of the House of Representatives, and we have examples of that now that, that um, exist as well. Look, in a perfect world, you'd want to have it all be totally civil, but life doesn't work that way. Um, is it possible for a, a, a politician who is focused on policy to get elected today, or do you have to be a celebrity of some sort? Well, um, anybody interested not, in my not to name names, my long-winded <laughs> policy papers uh, that I'm sure you all read with riveting excitement. Um, I'm certainly not the example of. Uh, uh, look, I, I, I take responsibility for for my loss, um, but we did try to run a policy campaign, and it, it failed miserably in the age of personality, at least this last election, it was, it was a lot about personality and a lot about anger and, you know, you could either say understanding people's anger or preying on their angst one, one way or the other. The, the Republican nominee um, did an extraordinary job doing that and it, it changed the whole context of the, the campaign. So, and in the, on the left you have a similar kind of environment as well. So policy, isn't necessarily, I've always thought, if you want to do big things, you better say what you want to do when you run, because it gives you the mandate to go do it. Um, and that was my experience when I ran. Uh, it didn't, didn't apply in 2016. Our uh, program is titled Conscience and Courage in Public Life. Um, so how much courage should we expect from our public officials? And for that matter, how much honesty? Well, I think, I think we need a lot more of both, for sure. Look, it's the, the test of courage, there's simple tests for that. It's if you have a deeply held belief and it goes against what your constituency or what your base or, you know, name your, your political term, what they, they agree, but you're prepared to stick with it and try to persuade them, that's courageous. It's not courageous to be, you know, changing your views with the wind. It's, it's standing on principle, um, whether you're right or wrong, you believe it with passion and conviction, and it may not be popular. That we need more of, because ultimately, leadership's about persuading people. It's not mimicking them or mirroring them, it's about convincing them. And if you can't, if you can't stand by what you believe, how can you convince anybody? People lose confidence immediately. Honesty uh, is, harder to define, I think, a little bit. I mean, people are called liars now, like with the drop of a hat, when you might have a differing point of view. And one of the things I think is important that's, that's hard to do is admit you're wrong or change your mind. Those are two concepts that actually happen in life with great regularity. Uh, we make mistakes, 
And in, in real life, you know, you can say, man, I screwed up. That was a really dumb idea. I messed up. I apologize. In politics, you do that and, you know, the wrath of God comes down on you. And, or having a view that's based on inf new information and you change your view, that somehow you've lost your manhood if you're a man and womanhood if you're a woman, that's wrong too. Because the world is changing at warp speed. And to assume that you know, your view that you held in 1995 is relevant at all in 2017, think about it. The, the world is radically different and the new information that we have should inform the thinking going forward. So uh, we don't have much tolerance for politicians that evolve on views based on new information and we cer certainly don't give them a lot of rope. Um, uh, we don't, you know, courage is not rewarded best I can tell. Uh, there's, there's greater downside to that short, on a short-term basis. But man, there's a lot of other things you can do to serve. Uh, you can serve your Lord, you can serve your community, you can serve your family, you can serve in all sorts of ways. You don't have to be a politician. And if it's miserable because you always have to bend with the wind or put your you know, integrity in, a, in the witness protection program or you know, basically just go along to get along, then why do it? It's a miserable job. No one likes you anymore. I mean, it's like if you were a congressman or senator when you flew back from Washington uh, to Minneapolis on Friday afternoon and you had the emblem that showed you you were a United States senator back then, people said, wow, United States Senator Dave Durenberg, that's a great deal. Congressman Kennedy, man, we admire you. Now these poor guys that show up, they keep their head down because people are shouting obscenities at them or whispering them at least. So if you can't stand on principle and do what you think is right and it's a miserable job, find something else to do. Former Governor Jeb Bush, Bush joining us here this evening. Thank you. That was good.